This is Cruise Radio. I cruise a lot and I always sail with travel insurance. You should too. Get a free quote today at tripinsurance.com. Broadcasting from the tripinsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida. This is Cruise Radio. Cruise Radio. Hey, how's it going? My name is Doug Parker. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Cruise Radio on the road this week. So we'll jump right to it. Staff writer Richard Sims. Hey, Richard. Hey, Doug. We kick things off with a disturbing report about a waiter being attacked by a passenger on a cruise ship. Yeah, details are a little bit scarce on this one, but it seems a passenger was on a Mediterranean cruise and they were using their drink package to purchase cocktails for other people. Uh, Of course, this is a big no-no. That's one of the reasons that cruise lines insist that everyone in a stateroom have their own drink package as opposed to sharing. Anyway, the waiter reminded the passenger that this wasn't allowed, and eventually things got very heated. First, the upset passenger reportedly dumped a beer over a waiter's head. Now, you'll notice I said a waiter and not the waiter, and that's because he did this to the wrong waiter, not the one who was trying to prevent him from breaking the rules. The passenger did eventually attack his actual server, He beat him with a glass, which eventually broke, and did what sounds like some pretty severe damage to the waiter's face. Needless to say, the passenger was disembarked by uh, at the ship's next stop in Greece, and the waiters filed a police report, all of which leads to our periodic reminder that while having a drink package is all well and good, it's important to drink responsibly. Mm, unreal. And Carnival has made a decision that caused a bit of a debate among passengers. Okay, so obviously we are in the midst of a presidential campaign, a very heated one at that. And as part of that, we're heading toward the first debate between the two presidential candidates. This is something that a whole lot of people, you know, rightly find very important. And, you know, it, it may help influence their decision which way to vote, that kind of thing. So someone asked Carnival's brand ambassador if they might be showing the debate, whether on the big screen or the jumbotron or in a bar or at the very least in passenger cabins. Field said, in essence, no, go go enjoy your vacation. Um, And then he asked people to respond. Do they is this something they would want? You know, would they want the ability to watch the debate? And the vast majority of people Um, said no, they wanted to enjoy their vacation. Although a lot of other people said they they would like it. They just do think that it should be done in private, that they could watch it in their own rooms because it could be disturbing uh, to other guests who don't necessarily want to see it. It led to a lot of discussion about between those who want to disconnect from the world in general and politics in particular, and those who think this is an important broadcast. But at the end of the day, it seems as if it will not be broadcast. I think what's interesting is, I think, I can't remember who's holding the first debate. I want to say it's ABC, but I might be wrong. But I think in some cases, things like this, they don't necessarily have control over. They can sh- they can decide not to show it on the big screen. But if it is being carried by a network that they broadcast in the rooms, then people would be able to watch it in their rooms. But like I said, I I, I forget which network is doing it here, but Carnival will not be making any, you know, special efforts to broadcast the debate. And speaking of Carnival, they just released information about future itineraries, including news about two ships heading to Alaska in 2026. There are some people out there who probably find it crazy to be talking about 2026 cruises, but I'm a big believer in planning ahead, especially when it comes to something like an Alaska cruise, which might be a bucket list trip for a lot of people. And, you know, it typically requires more advanced planning than maybe a trip to the Bahamas. Like when I go to the Caribbean or the Bahamas, I jump on a ship and I often don't even know what the itinerary is. I'm usually doing it because of the ship. But with my Alaska trip that I have scheduled in May of next year, I mean, I booked that like quite a while ago. So it makes sense that they want to get these schedules out there. So Carnival revealed this week that the Miracle and the Carnival Spirit will both be doing sailings to Alaska out of Seattle. I believe there's a third ship that is also going to be announced later, but they have not at this point revealed what that ship is is. Uh, They also announced that the Carnival Paradise would be sailing a variety of itineraries while homeporting in Tampa year-round. 
And that from November of 2026 until March of 2027, that's right, 2027, the Carnival Legend will also be doing sailings out of Tampa. There are a lot of itineraries yet to be released for 2026, 2027, you know, whatever, uh, especially given how big Carnival's fleet is. Obviously, there are a lot of reasons for opening up sailings this early, but one of the big ones is it gives them a chance to collect deposits and bank them where they're earning interest. You know, it's, you know, they've had, they've had uh, Holland America is the line I'm sailing on in May. And they've had, I actually paid the whole thing off when I booked it. So they've had my money for, I don't know, eight months or something, and they're collecting interest on it instead of me. And maybe that's a mistake. Maybe I should have waited until the final payment date, which a lot of people do, but I kind of like to pay things off in advance. Anyway, so lots of big news with various itineraries coming out of Carnival. You can um, swing over to their website and, you know, it's pretty easy to search there and find exactly what you're looking for if you want to get your head start on 2026. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't remember before the shutdown that itineraries were opening this far in advance. I always thought it was like 16 to 18 months out. I do feel as if we're seeing a lot of cruise lines open itineraries far farther into the future than what we saw just a couple of years ago uh you know and that's also you know not perhaps not coincidentally we're also seeing that as we get closer to those far-flung dates we see a lot of changes we see cancellations we see ships being moved um so you know it's on the one hand you're getting to book in advance which Hopefully you're getting a great deal on, but there's also the possibility that when it gets closer, you may have to do a little shifting around. Well, it looks like it'll cost you a little bit more if you want to sail to two popular ports. Yeah, we're talking about Cozumel and Costa Maya, and each of these ports is now going to be charging an additional $5 port fee or tax, which is the same thing, per person. Um, this money is being used in two different ways. 70% of it will be used to help cover the impact of tourism on the local infrastructure because, you know, you, you bring that many people into a port every day and it does have an effect on everything from the sewers to the bus lines to, you know, the, the, the condition of the roads. And so a lot of ports are now saying, you know, we need more money to help cover that cost. The other 30% is going to go into a fund that's designated to help the areas recover in the wake of disasters. So like when a hurricane hits, they want to have a fund that is available to them. And so 30% of this new tax that's being collected will go into that. We're seeing this move, uh, not necessarily as far as creating a fund for future disasters. But as far as increasing the taxes and fees being charged to cruise ships in particular, we're seeing this more and more from various ports as they're trying to sort of, I guess, make up for the impact that we see of tourism and over tourism, depending on the ports. So, you know, we saw it in the Bahamas, we've seen it in other places. And I assume that this is one of those trends that we'll continue seeing more and more of in the future. And Brazil has made arrangements to rent two cruise ships for a rather ironic purpose. We've talked before about the fact that while you and I both love all things cruise related, we are also willing to acknowledge, you know, because everything you love has a flaw. Your partners have flaws. Your, you know, your children have flaws. You love them anyway. We love all things cruising, but they aren't necessarily the best thing in the world for the planet in general, the environment in particular. So it's a little bit ironic that Brazil is going to be renting two cruise ships on which they will be housing the participants of, wait for it, the 30th annual summit on climate change being held next November. That's right. They are renting cruise ships in order to house the participants in a climate change summit. So, you know, make of that what you will. They apparently, the, the area that the event is being held in does not have nearly enough um, hotel rooms for all of the people involved in both, both attending something like this and putting it on. And in order to do this, they're not only hiring 
uh, the or renting these two cruise ships, they'll also have to do some dredging, and they're going to in, in, increase the. Uh, they're going to pour some money into the actual port itself, so that it's a more welcoming place for visitors. Yeah, say what you will. And we'll wrap up with news about a piece we've been covering for the past a couple of years, or I guess few years. And one piece of maritime history is being prepped for a new home, but this time it's at the bottom of the sea. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about this. So. You're right. We've been talking for quite a while about the SS United States. It's a classic cruise liner. It was built back in the 50s. Uh, She was the largest cruise liner ever built entirely in the United States. So, you know, definitely a lot of history tied up in this ship, uh, which is currently docked outside of Philadelphia. And for a while, there were plans that maybe it would be turned into a hotel or maybe they would try and make it into a museum or, you know, something along those lines. But All of those plans have sort of failed. And so the conservancy, which I know I'm pronouncing that wrong, which is responsible for the ship, is now closing in on a deal. We should know by next week. Uh, They're closing in on a deal to basically sink the ship off the coast of Florida, and it will become part of uh, the, the, the goal is to make it the world's largest artificial reef. You know, we've heard about things like they've taken subway cars and dumped them in the ocean to become artificial reefs and cars and things like that. There are also some, um, you know, ships that have sunk over the years. Uh, The Titanic is basically a large natural artificial, not natural, artificial reef now. That is what they are planning for this very historic classic ship is to sink it and make it a uh, an artificial reef, which I assume would also be, you know, kind of a great tourist spot. Who wouldn't want to go snorkeling down and sort of poke around in this old ship as it's be- as it slowly but surely transforms into this natural piece of the ocean? Uh, it's it's kind of cool, but it's also kind of sad because you know I I kind of hoped that maybe they would eventually be able to turn it into a hotel like what what is it the, the queen mary i think it is a good purpose though i mean it's yeah. it's you know the, the world needs more coral reefs the sea this is good for the sea so ultimately i think the real challenge i i believe i read that the project has about a nine million dollar budget and i have to believe that one of the biggest expenses involved in this will be moving it because that's been one of the problems with the ship all along is you know there were various people uh, or organizations over the past few years that have been interested in it but the question becomes how do you move it and of course you know how much is that going to cost so like i said they're voting on that this week so we should hopefully have an update next week on whether this is going to become a reality or not Very good. Staff writer Richard Sims, as always. Thank you, my friend. Always glad to be here. Have a question or a comment for the show? Yeah! Send an email or voice memo to Doug at CruiseRadio.net. A big question we get at Cruise Radio is, how do I know if I need trip insurance? Simple answer. If you're getting on a plane, taking a road trip, or getting on a cruise ship, you need to have travel insurance. Hey, it's Doug Parker for my friends at TripInsurance.com. Not not only does TripInsurance.com protect your vacation investment, but it also gives you peace of mind in case anything were to go wrong on your trip. How do they do it? They offer three different types of trip insurance policies. Good, better, and best. One policy for every vacation budget. But it doesn't just stop there. They're up to 40% lower when you shop around on other comparison sites. Plus, TripInsurance.com offers 24-hour customer support support before, during, and after your trip, online claims assistance, and travel alerts to let you know what's going on at your destination. But find out for yourself. Check out tripinsurance.com. The world is constantly changing. Your place for news is still the same. Online and on demand at cruiseradio.net. Jeremy just returned from a 12-night cruise on Royal Caribbean's Jewel of the Seas out of Amsterdam. Had some killer ports of call on this one. He joins us on the line. How you doing, bud? Good. Good to be here, Doug. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, good to talk to you again. I can't wait to hear all about Jewel of the Seas, a ship I haven't sailed in, gosh, 
13 years at this point, I think. Um, and the itinerary, of course. Before we get to Europe, though, we'll take a step back. You're in central Florida. What made you want to take this 12-nighter out of Amsterdam? Yeah, great question. So Iceland for us has been a bucket list uh, port stops for a while now. And uh, given the summer heat in Florida, we're always ready to get to a cooler climate. So uh, we were kind of excited about it. And we sail a lot on the larger ships out of Florida, but we were kind of ready for a more traditional size cruise ship for the community feel. And so we decided to book this 12 night cruise about a year ago, and uh, it was an amazing time in Europe. So excited to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, any uh, pre-cruise time, you make your way from Orlando over to Amsterdam. Is that a direct flight? You know, not during this time of year. Um, we actually had to go through Atlanta, um, which was kind of interesting because we went to fly out of Atlanta um, on our connection, and the pilot came out saying that there were bed bugs on our plane coming over <laughs> from Amsterdam. Yes. And so what well, definitely a unique travel experience, and we had the option to wait, but we decided to go and I can uh, confidently say we did not get any bed bugs. So we're <laughs> glad for that. Um, yeah. We um we stayed in Amsterdam for uh, about 48 hours. The ship left on a Sunday. So we were able to come over Friday morning and um, just spend some time exploring Amsterdam and walking around. And, um, you know, there's a lot of activity there. Definitely a lot of nightlife. And um, we were able to stay um, right at the um, hotel right near the port, which was awesome. The double tree there. So perfect location and perfect amount of time just to explore before we got on Jewel. Awesome. So you make your way to the Amsterdam cruise port. How was embarkation and how long did it take you to get from the curb to the ship? Like I said, we stayed right by the uh, pier. And so we had about a 10 minute walk with our luggage. Um, I will also say Amsterdam is very easy to fly into and just train from um, the airport to the port area. So we, we did do that when we came in where there's a bunch of hotels. We were able to walk just 10 minutes to the uh, port and we and then went through and we literally walked straight through from everything giving our luggage to security to walking on I would say uh, from the curb to getting onto the ship was less than 10 minutes so it was really easy and um, it's a great port to go out of yeah and Amsterdam really does have that public transportation system down to a science like it's just so you can go anywhere from ship well pretty much pretty much anywhere in Europe if you wanted to yeah it's incredible yeah. And, and you know as as many cruisers know Amsterdam is going to be limiting uh, the number of ships per year. So I would encourage folks to get on the list for Amsterdam sooner rather than later. Yeah, for sure. So you make your way on board Jewel of the Seas, a little bit of an older ship. You mentioned you like to sail the big ones out of Florida. What were your first impressions walking on board Jewel? We actually had done a little bit of research before we booked it and Jewel went under a renovation in April of 2024. Um, so just uh, less than two months before we sailed, which was awesome. Um, wasn't any sort of like uh, large renovation, but it was new carpet throughout the whole ship, new paint, um, just a really a deep clean. So it definitely felt newer than it actually is, which was really nice. And kind of walking through, um, you know, we've been on Radiance class before, but I think the fact that it just had a renovation, it just felt like uh, a newer experience. Now, and they actually, Royal uses the same kind of motifs that you'll see on like Wonder or Utopia of the Sea. So it's even the kind of the same decor as some of the newer ships. I will say that some of the ship is still dated a little bit. Um, the Solarium, in my opinion, has a very dated Asian motif um, that could use an upgrade. But I think that um, they did a good job. It, one of my comments would be, and, and I think um, others would agree, I, I wish Royal would add some more fast, casual dining options that I'll talk about later on the older ships because, um, you know, Carnival and NCL have a lot of those quick services by the pool and, and Royal really hasn't went back and added those. So that that would be one thing I would say if you're looking for those options for the daytime dining doesn't exist on Jewel. Yeah, for sure. What kind of stateroom did you book for this 12 night cruise? And what did you think of it throughout your voyage? So we booked a junior suite guarantee. Um, so we typically for the longer cruises will splurge a little bit for a larger room just because, you know, 12 nights is a good amount of time in the room. Um, and so we got our cabin assigned through the guarantee model about a month out. Um, and we actually received an accessible room um, for someone that has mobility issues. And the interesting thing about that is it's actually about double the size of a normal normal junior suite. So it was on, on, almost 300 square feet. <laughs> um, so we really lucked out. And it was plenty of room for 12 days, had a, a, a huge balcony, all new carpet, as I said, uh, new furniture in the room, really great walk-in closet. So really nice room. You know, we love the balcony. Unfortunately, the weather um, in Northern Europe in the summer, we didn't use it at all, but it was definitely beautiful. Did they have USBs installed during the latest upgrade or maybe they did it before the, the shutdown one in there? So they only had the European chargers and then the American chargers. Mm -hmm. um, I will say 
you know, we brought our European converters for Amsterdam. So we were able to use those, which helped. And, you know, I, it actually made me think I've never thought to bring the European converters sailing out of Florida, but I might have to do that because those exist on the ships that go out of here too and provide more options. Yeah, that thought always comes to my mind and then I always forget to do it and forget to pack it. Your junior is sweet though. So did that come with any extra perks aside from like the 300 square feet, but anything outside of that, um, like any extra amenities maybe? Um, it does not come with extra amenities. It does give you double points for your um, status through the Crown and Anchor program. And so for us each, the other thing that was pretty appealing is that was 24 points for Crown and Anchor. So um, it'll be a while before we get to Pinnacle, but it definitely helps um, in that journey. Let's talk about the food on this 12-night voyage. We'll start at the Windjammer, the buffet area. How was it up there uh, throughout the 12 nights and crowds during peak times? Yeah, I would say that the uh, Windjammer was sufficient. Um, they, the food was good. You know, it wasn't anything to write home about, but we definitely ate there for breakfast and lunch. Um, the Radiance class, they kind of have an extra room towards the entryway, and then they have an outdoor area um, for the Windjammer, and then... Actually, if you walk completely aft, there's a full outside area um, where you can sit and really watch the views and sit outside. So I, I actually think for the size of the ship, it's very well equipped for the Windjammer. Never felt crowded like I have on, on some of the other Royal ships. Unfortunately, it was a little too cold to sit outside some days. So I don't know that that area was fully used, but the food was pretty good. And, you know, it was a great spot to grab a salad or a soup or just, you know, a cheeseburger. So uh, we enjoyed the Windjammer. And how about the main dining room? Uh, what time dining did you have and how was your experience in there? Yeah, so we did my time dining um, just to kind of add some flexibility. You know, as, as many know, the European ports, sometimes you're not back on till later, given the long port days. So uh, we, we appreciate the main dining room flexibility. And it was really good. I was very impressed with the food selection. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, you know, we often do a three or a seven night and it's the same on Royal, like, you know, welcome aboard night, French night, Italian night. But on a 12 night, we got to do some unique menus. Um, so we had like taste of the UK, taste of the Mediterranean, taste of Asia, taste of the USA. So it was definitely a lot of variety and a lot of the food was really good. The taste of Asia night was my favorite. Um, had some great pad thai as well as um, some spring rolls. So we just really appreciated that. Did you find that the service was up to par? Yeah, the service was really good. I mean, the one thing that always gets me is the asking for the 10 out of 10 on the survey at the end of the cruise. But outside of that, I would say that the, the service was very good. We felt very satisfied. They were also pretty quick. Some of the other ships I've noticed with my time, you know, the lines can get pretty long, you know, as you en enter, but there was never really a line getting in, which was nice and convenient. This ship has a couple of specialty restaurants. It's like what Giovanni's Chops and what is the sushi? Is it the sushi one? Like the Azumi or? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Did you dine at any of those? So we did a five night dining package, which we thought was good for 12, 12 days. Um, we really like Azumi. So we went to that. It's interesting on this ship. It, um, is actually on deck 12 aft, um, kind of near the sports area. Um, so it, it's a little unique to find on the Radiance class. And actually one of the days, um, the weather was pretty bad. So they had to have uh, the crew escort guests up through kind of a crew stairwell because the only entry point is outside and deck 12 was closed, which was kind of interesting, but great sushi. Um, they have a lot of, um, you know, udon and soups, et cetera. So it, it was really good. Um, we also ate at Chops and Giovanni's, um, which were good. I think um, not a huge steak person, but I, I definitely enjoy Chops for some of their shrimp and other items. Um, and Giovanni's um, was, I thought, one of the best Giovanni's I'd been to. So the soup was pretty good. Um, we also like their pastas and they just they just give you so much food. I'll also share we um, also did the chef's table, which we do not always do, um, but we did it on the second night. Uh, really to meet other folks. And it was a great experience. You know, they put you at a, a long table. There was maybe 20 ish people um, at the seating and they pair, I think it was five courses with five wines. Um, so there's a lot of food and a lot of drink. But, you know, I, I found that when we travel, just my husband and I, it's it's nice to kind of meet people earlier on just to try to, you know, make friends and see them throughout the ship. So that was a really good experience. And they do it down um, near the lounge area on deck six on that ship. And um, it was just a really fun and engaging night. With the five meal package, like if you're doing price comparisons, are you getting a much better deal buying that package before you cruise than if you're paying a la carte pricing on board? Yeah, 100%. Um, I watched the cruise sales a good bit. Um, and I think 
you know, we probably paid, uh, I want to say we paid around 130 or 140 for five nights. And, you know, I think chops is almost 50 or $60 a night um, if you went on board. So I, I definitely think it's worth it. And what I found with Royal Caribbean, really with almost anything is it's better to book early and book through the cruise planner. And I think the other piece of that too, is you can always cancel within 48 hours of sailing um, or 48 hours of an excursion. So to me, it's no risk and totally worth it to try and save some money. Awesome. Did we miss any dining places you may have hit some like grab and goes? I know you said the ship l- lacked some of that stuff. Yeah, they, they do have a Solarium Cafe, which is probably similar to like Cafe Promenade on Royal and the other ships. Um, I hate to end on a downer, but I would say that was the biggest disappointment. I mean, um, they only had a few options and they actually, that's where they serve the pizza. And I'm a huge Sorrento's fan. Um, it's one of my favorites. And this pizza was nothing like Sorrento's. I, I just, it felt um, not very flavorful and more like cardboard. So we were a little disappointed in that, that they also did have a Cafe Latitudes down on, I believe, Deck 5, where you could get like some small tea sandwiches and coffees. And that wasn't bad as well. But I think the specialty dining and main dining room were the highlights of the dining experience. Did you have the drink package on here? We did not. Um, we, because of our Diamond Plus status, have five drinks a day each. Um And then um, I spent a little too much time in the casino last year. So with the (laughs) casino program as well, we did not get the dining or the drink package, excuse me. Let's talk about the entertainment on board this 12 night cruise. How did it stack up for you? Yeah, I think the the entertainment was probably what I expected going in. I mean, um, it's not necessarily going to be the entertainment of Icon of the Seas or, um, you know, some of the other royal ships. But I think um, the entertainment was good. We went to a few production shows. Um, there's not an ice uh, arena or any water shows on this ship, um, but we went to some of the production shows and it's you know pretty much like you'd see in the Vegas style old, old school cruising. But I do think that the like love and marriage game and the quest adult game show were really good. And, and we just had a really good entertainment staff. And so those were super engaging and actually did two love and marriage shows, which we found really funny and hysterical. So uh, we went to those the other thing I'll I'll share, we we were cruising during both Canada Day and the July 4th holiday. Um, and so they did a lot of programming around those holidays, which is really nice as well. We don't often cruise ships that still have the centrum, you know, the large kind of entertainment space in the center of the ship with all the floors. So it was nice to see activities done in that area. I mean, they had, you know, a violinist and they often had a band down there. So I think the uniqueness of being on like I said earlier, your more traditional old cruise ship was a little bit novel for us. And we enjoyed that. Does Royal still use the like the live orchestra at their production shows? They do on some sailings. Yes, okay. um, they did not on this cruise. How was this ship as far as crowds and congestion? And uh, did you get to like find out how many people were on board? Was it a full sailing? Was it over capacity? Any kind of info you can give us? Great question. Um, so I will say that it never felt crowded. And I think that's partly because on a European sailing, we had, you know, a mix of nationalities. There was a good amount of Australians, Americans. There were a lot of people from the UK, Asia. And what I found is culturally people from different parts of the world value different parts of the cruise experience. And so I think it often spreads people out. You know, when you think about a Caribbean sailing often out of like, you know, Florida, People want to be on the pool deck. And so everybody's there and it's super crowded. But I think when people have different wishes between the pool deck or the casino or shopping, you know, it definitely spreads people out. It was a full sailing. We were at capacity. And so I think it's around like 27 or 2800 for Jewel. So it was definitely full, but, you know, it was spread out well. I I think even in some of the people we met too, the pace of energy on the European sailings, especially in Northern Europe, is a little different and it's a little bit more relaxation and reading books and then just exploring the port. So yeah, it felt very spacious for the size of the ship and people on board. Is the Diamond Lounge still a thing on board Royal Caribbean or did they, I remember like there was some pushback about the Diamond Lounge about a year or two ago. Is that still a thing? It's still a thing. It's been rebranded as the Crown Lounge such that they're able to kind of dictate per sailing based off of who is sailing that particular um, itinerary what levels can get in. So it's um, before it was the Diamond Lounge and it was Diamond, Diamond Plus, Pinnacle. It's now Crown Lounge. And so um, for our sailing, it still had the same entry point, anyone Diamond or above. But for those sailings that have more of the higher status, they'll kind of limit who goes in. And I think that has 
had caused some frustration. Um, but the Crown Lounge on this ship exists up at the top um, within the Crown um, near the dance club. And they actually have an overflow area. So there, there was plenty of space. Um, it is interesting, though. I think, you know, culturally, depending on what sailings they're on, you know, it opens every morning for breakfast at seven o'clock. And then some of the days, you know, we were actually able to get off by 7 a.m. And so there was a little bit of push and pull between getting it open earlier for folks to have their morning espresso or breakfast. Um, but the Royal accommodated and um, it was it was not overly crowded, but there were a good amount of people in there each morning. You've been sailing Royal for uh, quite a while. Did you ever sail the Sovereign class? So Majesty was my first cruise ship ever with my parents and sister um, in 2012. So yes, I have. I fell in love with the, what was it, the Viking Crown Lounge up there? That like the disc looking thing on those ships? Is that where the quote unquote Diamond Lounge would be on this one? Yes. Okay. So the, the Diamond Lounge as well as the Dance Club is outside of that, but it's all within that Crown, sort of, so to speak. And actually the... Um, the dance club bar area there, it actually has a rotating bar. So oh, if you wow. sit at the bar there, it rotates around, which is kind of cool. <sighs> That's cool. You mentioned you spent a little bit too much time in the casino last year. Any any time in this one? And how was the smoking situation in and around it? Yeah, um, definitely spent a few nights in the casino. Um, you know, like I said earlier, the entertainment wasn't as robust as some of the other ships. So this, this was a good substitute. Um, they do have a smoking section kind of when you enter in on the right. Um, I avoided that area. Um, and kind of stayed more towards the left and in the back. And um, I did not think it was that bad as long as you kind of were strategic about where you were and what you were playing. Um, so definitely spent some time in there. Again, not very crowded. I don't think there were a ton of gamblers, um, which was actually kind of fun because those of us that were in there, you know, some nights ended up kind of meeting each other because when there's less people, you're, you know, you kind of say hello. Um, and I did spend the nights that I was in there. I did spend my time at the Buffalo and uh, <laughs> shockingly, it was it was much better than I've seen on other ships. So awesome. that was really nice. And they had uh, four Buffalo right next to each other. And I know you mentioned that before, and it's definitely <laughs> one of my favorite games. Well, now they're getting out of control, though. There's like Buffalo White, Buffalo Ascension, Buffalo Gold. There's like 15 different versions now. So it's it's hard to keep up when you're up. That's awesome. man. yeah, I think I mentioned yeah. it on the show before the, the woman next to us on Sun Prince took home $10,000 on a 60 cent pull. That's crazy. Yeah. I, I didn't go that far, but I did hit one spin for a thousand and I was, I was happy about that. Yeah, very, very cool. So let's talk about the ports of call on this 12 night cruise. So you leave Amsterdam, give us the first port of call, give us your highlight and we'll move to the next one. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I have to preface this with um, my Icelandic is not perfect. So I might mess up the pronunciation of some of the ports. And of um, But our first stop was Reykjavik, uh, which the, being the capital of Iceland, Iceland. Really enjoyed that stop. We were one of the first people off the ship. And so we got off around eight o'clock in the morning and uh, we walked around through the town. Um, we walked up the famous Rainbow Street that people take pictures on and walked up to the, the church. Um, and then we continued on and kind of had some lunch um, at a local spot. Um, you know, one of the biggest things about this sailing was uh, I've never seen so many sheep in my life because all of the you know countries we were at, the sheep are very um prosperous. And so we were able to have a lamb burger for lunch in Reykjavik, which was delicious. Um, and then after that, we went to the Sky Lagoon. Um, so many folks might know the Blue Lagoon, um, which is, you know, the larger popular lagoon. But due to the volcanic activity this summer, um, it was really challenging to get there. So we went to the Sky Lagoon and it was awesome. Um, you know, truly unique experience. You kind of get out and enter into a locker room and, and put on your bathing suit. And then from the locker room, you immediately immerse in a lagoon and you kind of swim through this, you know, person made lagoon and go out to uh, basically a resort style pool that you might see at a resort in the States, um, but overlooking the ocean and just um, such a nice geothermal bath. Um, they had like a, st a seven step rejuvenation process where you do like hot, cold, hot, cold, um, and even a swim up bar, like within the lagoon. So Really great experience um, and would encourage folks um, if you make it there to do one of the lagoons in Iceland. Did the folks uh, that were, didn't go to the Blue Lagoon, the, the main popular one, did most of them gravitate towards that one? You know, it's interesting. Um, it was a little bit of both. So Royal would not. So we had a Blue Lagoon excursion uh, booked. Royal canceled it. And so there were no official excursions. But there were quite a few folks we spoke with actually either uh, rented a car or got a taxi and went on their own. 
Um, and so the main road to the Blue Lagoon was closed, but there was an alternative route. Um, but I think to avoid risk, you know, you couldn't really do an excursion there. Mm-hmm. But I think the other half went to the Sky Lagoon. So, um, but I think both options would be good um, if you're interested. Okay. So now what was up next? So next we went to Issa Fjord, Um, And there we, one of the interesting things about Iceland is, you know, sailing in, you're almost like in Stockholm or some of the other ports, it's, you know, a long sail in through the fjord. And so just beautiful coming in to that port. Um, We did an excursion where we went on a hike through Royal Caribbean and up to a waterfall. So that was really uh, nice. It was probably one of our most adventurous excursions. It's about an hour hike um, up to the waterfall, 50 degrees and sunny. And again, like living in Florida right now, that was very enjoyable weather. Mm -hmm. And then after the hike, they took us to like a local fishing village where we could try some of the local fish, um, which is one of the biggest, you know, um, industries within Iceland. And they, we were able to try fish jerky, uh, which essentially is like beef jerky, but it was made of cod, um, which was kind of a cool experience. I've had whale jerky before in Norway. I've never had um, cod jerky. Interesting. But sounds good though. What was next? So we actually next was supposed to be Sejusfjorda on the... Uh, west side of Iceland, but that was actually canceled, um, which is interesting. It was high winds of 60 miles per hour, and it was about 30 degrees in that port in the end of June. (laughs) So we didn't get to stop there, um, had a sea day. But then we went along to Akureyri, uh, which was probably our favorite port stop on the sailing. Um, It's in the northern part of Iceland, and we got off early in the morning. We actually came in probably around midnight because we had a medical emergency. Um, And so we were there super early and could get off as soon as you woke up, which was awesome. Um, And we walked around the cute little town with some shops and restaurants. And it's actually a big university town in Iceland, which was interesting. But we did a royal excursion to Husavik, uh, where we went, uh, which is about a town an hour away, where we did another geothermal bath um, on the ocean. And um, it was just so beautiful. I mean, it was right on the ocean. The mountains are in the background. They had just had a big snowfall in early June, so the mountains were all capped uh, with snow, which just such a truly amazing experience. Um, and Husavik um, is actually the town where the movie Eurovision Sound Contest took place with mm-hmm. Will Ferrell. Um, so there were a lot of people there kind of seeing that town because of that movie. Um, and then on the way back from there, we stopped at a local waterfall and were able to kind of get out and see that. So just a really cool day. I uh, really enjoyed that town, and I think we... We love a port where we can do a little bit of city and shopping and then a little bit of exploring. And I think it had it all there. Now, my thermal lagoon experience is very, very limited. Is every single one like very nice and very blue lagoon like? Yeah, I would say the first one was like you're saying, like the blue lagoon and um, a little bit more like perfect. The one we did in the other town was more organic. And I think, you know, our tour guide had even shared that the locals go there as well. So, you know, it still had the locker room and the whole spa like experience, but it was not as clear. And there was definitely like some moss in the pool and it felt more, more localized than the other one. So it was kind of nice to have both of those experiences. Gotcha. And then where did you go next? So after Iceland, uh, we went to Scotland. And so we stopped in Lurwick in the Shetland Islands. We did an island bus tour in Lurwick, um, smaller town um, there. So we kind of went around um, and got to see, you know, a, a bunch of different um, really old rock formations and um, some of the wildlife there, which was great. Um, unfortunately, though, after we finished that, we were there on a Monday. And so after our tour, most of the shops and restaurants were closed. And um, I definitely would make note for those booking, you know, sailings where you want to go to certain ports. Make sure you look on mon- Sundays and Mondays. Some of those ports are pretty shut down. So if there's something you're really looking for, I think we were a little disappointed in the lack of activity because it was a Monday at that stop. So after that, but where'd you go? After that, we went to Inverness in Scotland. Um, in the, it's about 45 minutes from the port. Um, so we actually booked an excursion through Royal um, called Inverness on your own, which really was essentially just a bus ride from the pier um, into Inverness. And then you had about four and a half hours on your own, um, which was perfect for us. Uh, we walked around really got to see a lot of the city. Um, it was pretty, the weather was, you know, questionable that day. It was pretty rainy. Um, so we walked around and we actually booked a distillery tour. Um, and we went to the local distillery, um, which was actually a distillery and a brewery. 
It was called Yulebeist, and it was really unique. We went there and um, did about an hour and a half tour of the facility, and then we're able to kind of hang out and do a little bit of a taste testing. And it was interesting just learning about there's a ton of whiskeys and also gins throughout Scotland right now. And so, you know, they found that doing the brewery was a way to kind of compete, which is interesting because I feel that the the breweries in, you know, America are oversaturated right now. So it was just kind of cool to learn about the culture there. Um, and they actually use the water right off of the Loch Ness River, um, which I thought was a really unique touch. Inverness, would that be the port to go see if you wanted to go try to find Nessie? It would be. And, you know, we thought about that, but it's it's one of those ports where it's kind of an either or, right? So you got to either commit to going to Inverness or Loch Ness. Um, so I think next time we'll go find Nessie. <laughs> and then after Inverness, where were you? Our last stop was in Edinburgh, um, which was in, you know also in Scotland. Um, and we, there's one of the cool things about this stop, it was a tender port. Um, so we did tender, um, and some of the other ones I mentioned earlier were as well, but we did tender to the pier. Um, but from there, they have great public transportation um, and a bus that you, I think we paid maybe uh, 12 um, pounds per person. And we it gives you round trip transportation from the pier to city center, um, which was about a 30 minute bus ride. So we took the bus into city center and then we walked. Um, we probably walked about 10 miles um, in Edinburgh, but it's it's a larger city and there was just a lot to see. Um, I work at a university, so we wanted to go see the University of Edinburgh. So we went over to that, which was cool. They were actually having graduation. Um, so it was kind of cool to see the culture around graduation at a university in Scotland. Um, and then we walked up to the Edinburgh Castle um, to check that out. Unfortunately, uh, the royals were actually there the date we were um, in Edinburgh. Uh, Prince Edward and the Queen, King Charles, Prince William were all in Edinburgh. So couldn't get too close to the castle because it was pretty uh, secure, um, but definitely a good memory. Awesome. Then you make your way back to Amsterdam. How was the debark process for y'all? Debark was great. Um, pretty simple. Uh, walked off with our luggage, uh, which we, we, we prefer um, I would say our stateroom to the curb was less than 10 minutes. Um, most of that was just kind of walking. We got off probably around eight o'clock um, in the morning. We were headed to the airport for um, midday flight. So kind of just walked off then. Um, and like I started with, we just walked from the pier back to the train station and took the train to the airport. So super accessible, um, easy port to go in and out of. Man, what a great bucket list itinerary you did. That just seems so cool. Yeah, um, we're so thankful and lucky to to experience it. Yeah, for uh, for sure. Looking back on this, do you have any first time tips to offer anyone who might be doing this itinerary or sailing Jewel of the Seas? I have two. Um, the first one is I really think that some ships are meant to be chosen for the itinerary, and some are meant to be chosen for the ship. And I think that's a really good framework when you're looking to book your cruise. Um, you know, we like Jewel of the Seas, but we booked this purely to go to Iceland and Scotland. And so we could have been on probably any any ship and been happy. But then there's also times um, we're excited to go on Utopia of the Seas uh, coming up here. And that is purely to see Utopia of the Seas, right? And all the, the new wonders of that new large ship. So I think, you know, as you're booking your cruise experience, just think about what are your goals and what do you want to see and get out of your vacation? And then based on that, choose the ship you go with. And then I think the second thing I would say, you know, being on the ship 12 days, we got a little bit tired of the Royal Caribbean drink menu. Um, they kind of typically have a, unlike other cruise lines, they have pretty much the standard menu at most bars, especially on the older ships. And so we actually um, brought some of our favorite martini recipes from Bar Louis, uh, uh, which is a chain kind of sports bar restaurant in the States. And we actually asked some of the bartenders in Vintages, uh, which is like the wine cocktail bar, to make them for us. And they were more than happy to. Um, so I would, you know, we just kind of basically had, you know, basic drinks that three or four ingredients, pretty common ones, um, and, you know, showed them the menu, showed them a photo, and they kind of enjoyed experimenting a little bit. And actually, uh, one of the great bartenders in Vintages said that he was going to um, offer it to future cruisers on the next sailings and, and tell them about one of the drinks we like. So I would just encourage you to, you know, make friends with your bartenders and dining staff. And they're really happy to kind of work with you if, if things on the menu aren't what you're looking for. You know, that's the first time I, I've heard that tip in 15 years. That, that's a great idea, bringing the the drink recipe on board and having your bartender make it, especially on a longer cruise where things, you know, you're just tired of the same old vodka soda or whatever. 
Exactly. Yeah. Get creative with it. Yeah, certainly. Your biggest highlight of this sailing? Yeah, I think the biggest highlight for me was Iceland. Um, It just was truly magical. You know, there are only 350,000 people in the country and it's just so vast. And, you know, we've done Alaska before and we love Alaska, but this I thought was a little bit better. Um, And the, the interesting piece I'll note outside of the ports, we went, our sailing date was June 23rd. So we were there right around the summer solstice. So after we had left Amsterdam, we did not see darkness for over six days. Um, wow. And during that time of the year, it just does not get dark around Iceland. And so it just was truly interesting. Like one of the nights came back from the casino, maybe a little too late, around 1.30 or so, and getting back to the stateroom. And it looks like it's two o'clock in the afternoon outside. <laughs> it really um, messes with you. It really does. you know. And, and, and they do have great blackout curtains, but it still is weird thinking about it. And after the third or fourth day, you're kind of like, am I ever going to see darkness again? Right? You kind of <laughs> have to train your body to adjust. One of our tour guides actually talked about that. And she was from Sweden but she's there in the summer and we were like, Oh, like why only the summer? And she was like, it's too depressing here in the winter. I could never live here. (laughs) In closing here, your final thoughts of Royal Caribbean's jewel of the seas. Yeah. My final thoughts are that jewel gets some really great itineraries um, from Northern Europe to, uh, I think it does Canada and the Boston sailings. And um, I think the radiance class with Royal are really great for unique sailings and especially long entry ports. Um, They were built with so many exterior views like the ocean facing elevators and just a lot of glass throughout. So I think it's a great ship um, for you to go on a unique itinerary and really enjoy it. And I think, you know, we booked this cruise really for Iceland and uh, Scotland. And, you know, I'm so glad we did because it's definitely one of our most memorable. We've been talking with Jeremy about his 12 night Northern Europe cruise on Royal Caribbean's Jewel of the Seas. As always, great talking to you, my friend. Thank you so much for sharing your vacation experience with us. Thanks, Doug. Good to be on the show. All right, Dougie, let's see what we got for you, buddy. Cruise Radio is produced at the TripInsurance.com studios in Jacksonville, Florida. Get cruise news, ship reviews, and money-saving tips every Thursday on Cruise Radio. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show. If you want to help spread the word, give Cruise Radio a five-star review. Find Cruise Radio where you listen to your favorite podcast or online at CruiseRadio.net. I'm your announcer.